In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Would you say that when people first fall in love, at least for some period of time, they act a little out of character? Maybe a, a little silly or distracted? A lot of these stories reappear at rehearsal dinners before the wedding. <laughs> well, Walt Disney had an answer for what this is all about, and it's in the movie Bambi. I wonder if you remember. Flower, the skunk, and Thumper, the rabbit, and Bambi ask their wise friend Owl why the birds are singing so loudly. And friend Owl, he actually hated all the singing every spring, saying it's a pain in his pin feathers. But he explains to his young forest friends that the birds are, do you remember? Twitterpated. <laughs> He said, nearly everyone in the forest gets twitterpated in the springtime. He says, you're walking along, minding your own business. You're either looking to the left or you're looking to the right when all of a sudden you ran smack into a face. <laughs> you begin to get weak in the knees. Your head is in a whirl and then you feel light as a feather. And before you know it, you are walking on air. And then you know what? You are knocked for a loop. And you completely lose your head. And that ain't all, he says. It can happen to anyone, even you and you and you. <laughs> and as we all know, people too do odd things when they're Twitterpated. Well, today we remember St. Francis. And speaking of singing lovebirds, have you noticed how often Francis is depicted with birds? The other day I was helping my aunt out of her car in her driveway and there on the wall of her house is Francis with the birds. I recently stepped into an Italian tile shop in Santa Barbara and they might as well have just called it the Francis shop. <laughs> I bought a little tile of him preaching to the birds and now he's in my home. And of course, he's here at St. Bart's. He's right around the corner here in the narthex, holding a bird, and he's outside in multiple, multiple places. Why are we so crazy for Francis, right? He's remembered as a lesser feast, and there isn't even a godly play story about him. Well, I think it's because he's a living example of what friend Owl described. He lost his head and walked on air. Deep down, I think that's what we all want. You've all probably heard over and over that Francis was born into a well-off family in Assisi. His father was in the cloth business and Francis loved a little sartorial splendor. Um, he had great military ambitions. He was very popular, a funny, funny guy. But one day, everything changed when he heard the voice of God. God asked him to rebuild his church, and Francis thought he meant the church of St. Damien, which lay in ruins right there in Assisi. And that's when the odd things began to happen. The first thing he did was he sold his horse. And then he sold some bales of his father's cloth that he was watching for him. And his father was a shrewd businessman and was not amused. He treated his son like a thief and had him incarcerated. But later, Francis and his father went before a bishop who asked Francis to compensate his father. And according to a biographer, Francis said, up to this time, I have called Pietro Bernardone father, but now I am a servant of God. Not only the money, but everything that is called his, I will restore to my father, even the very clothes he has given me. And he ripped off all of his garments. He put them in a pile in the middle of the floor and tossed all the money on top of it. And then he walked out. He walked out of the building into the woods on a cold, wintry day with snow on the ground, barely wearing anything. So here he was a man without skills, money, or parents, 
and he burst into song. This man was fully twitterpated with God. And by the world standards, you do odd things when you fall in love like this. And there are so many stories of Francis being odd, but one of my favorites is that he chased lepers. Now, I don't mean he chased them away like everyone else, but he chased them down to hug them. So this type of love is contagious. One day he was walking along and he saw an old piece of rope. So he picked it up and he tied it around his waist. So remember, he was a fashion guy before, so maybe he was going for the shabby chic look? I don't know, but just 10 years later, that look was the uniform for 5,000 men. But, oh wait, what's this? Hmm, 800 years later, cincture is a fancy name for a waist rope. Francis is everywhere. <laughs> From his love affair with God, Francis became like Jesus, who saw the world differently from the way other people do. Jesus saw holiness in everyone. We hear this in story after story in the Gospels. Jesus saw past personal history and societal labels. He saw holiness, and he called people to be that holiness, to own that holiness. And I know we are approaching Christmas, not Easter, but the most iconic example is when Jesus is crucified between two thieves. What does he do? He beckons the holiness of one of them and tells him that he will see him in heaven. Francis saw divinity in everything. Every tree was sacred. He didn't write off anyone or anything. And Francis heard God say, rebuild my church. And God wasn't just talking about the one in the village. So Francis led a holy life, fully in love with God, and many others joined him because they wanted that too. And the church was changed. But don't we want that as well? But how do we get there outside of joining a Franciscan monastery? Well, clergy and others receive regular counsel from people called spiritual directors. And not all, but many are retired clergy. And they make sure that we're staying close and in love with God. And I recommend spiritual direction for all people. And we have at least two here in our congregation. But primarily I share this with you because I wanna lift up something from my last session with my spiritual director. He's in Asheville, North Carolina, and I just found out he's okay, but without power. The week before, Helene was even on the radar. We had our session on Zoom, and coincidentally, we were talking about storms back east and wildfires out west, and we talked about what we would take from our homes if we had to evacuate. What do we have to hold on to? <clears throat> What are our non-negotiable necessities? What are those things that redefine us if they disappear from our lives? And I know that here in Poway, this has been more than an exercise for some of you. And I could preach a whole sermon just on that one topic, but I'll wrap up to say, for Francis, his love affair with God was his only non-negotiable necessity. He tossed everything else into a heap and he walked away from it. He had everything he needed. And that made him giddy. And some say foolish because he did things like chase lepers. But we know that like our friend Owl said, he was just Twitterpated with God. And that Twitter patient gave him a different lens in the world, a lens more like Jesus. And by uptaking the world through that lens, he was filled with an inner peace that even the birds and the wild animals sensed, and they weren't afraid of him. So that's it. Being head over heels in love with God, that's our non-negotiable necessity. It's all we need, even if others have to put up with our oddness. I think that's why we love our quirky saints so much. If it can happen to Francis, 
It can happen to anyone. And in the wise words of Friend Owl, even you and you and you. Amen.